Please be advised, some of the movie dialogue in this episode contains mature language. No one else. Hello, General Barringer, Stephen Falcon. Mr. Falcon, you picked a hell of a day for a visit. Uh, uh, General, what you see on these screens up here is a fantasy, a computer-enhanced hallucination. Those blips are not real missiles, they're phantoms. Jack, there's nothing to indicate a simulation at all. Everything's working perfectly. But does it make any sense? Does what make any sense? That. Look, I don't have time for a conversation right now. General, are you prepared to destroy the enemy? You bet you. Do you think they know that? I believe we've made that clear enough. Then don't. Tell the president to write out the attack. Sir, they need a decision. General, do you really believe that the enemy would attack without provocation, using so many missiles, bombers, and subs, so that we would have no choice but to totally annihilate them? One minute and 30 seconds to impact. General, you are listening to a machine. Do the world a favor and don't act like one. The Hollywood interview, John Badham. John Badham cut his directorial teeth on 70s-era television shows like The Bold Ones, The Streets of San Francisco, and Kung Fu in the early 1970s, before attaining A-list status with his second feature, Saturday Night Fever, in 1977. Films diverse as War Games, Blue Thunder, Nick of Time, and Bird on a Wire kept John Badham one of the busiest directors in the biz, having literally not stopped working since 1971. His 2006 book, I'll Be in My Trailer, co-written with Craig Moderno, has become required reading for virtually every neophyte film director in the business. 2020 finds Badham releasing a second edition of his 2013 bestseller, John Badham on Directing, notes from the set of Saturday Night Fever, War Games, and more. The book offers an engaging look at the psychological, technical, and managerial elements that go into helming a film or TV show, with a second edition featuring a new section called A Director's Survival Guide to Episodic Television. A veteran of over 30 films and 50 TV episodes, Badham supports his insights with true stories from his own directing career, as well as wisdom and anecdotes from leading actors, producers, cinematographers, and directors, including DJ Caruso, Gil Cates, Martha Coolidge, Richard Dreyfuss, Jodie Foster, John Frankenheimer, Patty Jenkins, Sidney Pollack, Brett Ratner, Steven Soderbergh, and Oliver Stone. John Badham on Directing Second Edition was published by Michael Wee's Productions and released September 1st, 2020. John Badham, who also teaches directing at Chapman University in Orange, California, sat down with me recently to discuss his latest publication and remarkable career. So I love this edition of the book, and I think it was a great idea to include the new section on TV directing as that's where the most interesting stuff is being done now. So really, you've come full circle in your career. Uh, you're back, back to the same world where you cut your teeth. Well, yeah, and it's a big difference, too, since since I was I was doing especially episodic TV, so much has changed, you know. I mean, obviously, we've gone to digital. Uh, our aspect ratio has changed. The kind of stories that we're telling are different. And, and we've expanded into the whole world of the Internet, you know, streaming video. And that's all over the place. So when I started, there were three networks. And, you know, prime time was 8 to 11, and that was basically what we were doing. But now, you know, there's you can't keep track of all of the different venues and, and some pretty fabulous programming that's being done. Well, let's talk a bit uh, about how those changes have also changed the job of a director, which you illustrated beautifully in the chapter on television by sharing an anecdote about what happened when you were directing an episode of The Shield. That was probably one of the first episodic uh, elements that I uh, shows that I did coming back to back to television, and I got into a, a little bit of a discussion with with the writer of the episode who was with me on the set. And I always love to have writers on the set, and he was he was kind of fussing about the staging, and th here we were about five minutes from going into meal penalty, which is always very stressful, and. And I said, no, we're going to do it this way. This is the way we're going to do it. And, and he, he turned around and 
left left the set and I realized I had overstepped my bounds. This, you know, first of all, I could have been smarter and realized this is his script. This is his baby. He's lived with it for weeks and weeks, if not months, and has a very definite idea of how it should be done. I, I should have been discussing it with him rather than than out of hand, just saying, no, this is what we're going to do. But anyway, I, I ran and apologized to him right away. We straightened it out. We did it as the way he preferred. But I had still, as, as they say, soiled my bed as far as they were concerned, and I couldn't blame them. You know, I, I you know, I just became clear to me that that I was no longer number two or three on the food chain, that I had dropped down several points, maybe to 14 or 15, and <laughs> in, in a kind of Kafka-like uh, change. We should point out that this writer was also the showrunner of the program. Is that correct? Uh, what you also made very clear about in the chapter is that the showrunner is now also the king. So it's not unlike the auteur era, which is when you started making feature films, when the director truly was the king. Right. Now let's talk about one of the first shows you got your start on, one of my absolute favorites of all time, Rod Serling's Night Gallery. And Serling is one of my great all-time heroes. Uh, at that point, Serling had the same amount of control, I'm guessing, as a showrunner today does, because even by the early 1970s, he was an iconic figure. He was, and he was very much involved in, in consulting on the scripts that the day-to-day -day showrunner Jack Laird was was doing and and Rod was you know doing two or three scripts a year, which uh, which was always exciting to see what he would he would come in with because that that mind has such an unusual twist to it that you're always really excited. I I got to do uh, two if not three of his scripts and and it was you know great fun. Welcome, art lovers. We offer for your approval a still life, if you will, of noise. A soundless canvas suggestive of sound. The mouth belongs to Pamela. In life, a shrieking battle axe made up of adenoids, tonsils, and sound decibels. In death, an unmuted practitioner of fishwifery. Undeterred and ungagged by what one would assume to be the great silencer. Some ghosts come back to haunt. Others come back simply to pick up where they left off. Our painting is called Pamela's Voice, and this is the Night Gallery. How well did you get to know Rod Serling? Well, just talking with him on some of the days that he would come in and do his introduction to the Night Gallery series. And so they do like eight or ten at a time. And they were always changing paintings and uh, all that kind of stuff. So he was easy to talk to. And one, what I remember is he was he was already starting to say, the world of television is changing. I'm not recognizing it anymore. And I thought, wow, I wonder what he's talking about. You know, he, he was right. It was, it was changing slowly but surely. You know, new networks were coming in, new ways of doing new kinds of storytelling. And, and the world of, of the Twilight Zone, you know, it was well in the past at that point. Did he mean in terms of doing anthology shows like Twilight Zone and Night Gallery? I think so. I think so, yeah. The anthology shows that were pretty big in the late 50s, early 60s, Richard Boone's show, even even the Chrysler Theater and the Craft Suspense Theater. Alfred Hitchcock. Alfred Hitchcock are all anthology shows, but people were leaning way toward having, you know, one set of leads that they followed all the time, uh, you know, like daytime soaps do. He felt that it was limiting his storytelling abilities because now you're just having to do it about Bob the husband and Annie the wife and the two little kids. And, you know, every week you got to do something about them. Did you get a sense of him as a person when you had these interactions with him? He was funny. He, tur he turned in the pilot for Night Gallery, which had a long introduction on it. You'll appreciate this. It was almost a page-long single-space speech from, from Rod Serling. And I, I looked at it, and I went to my boss, Bill Sackheim, I said, this speech seems kind of long here. And Bill said, well, call up Rod and tell him to cut it down. 
<laughs> I go, oh, no. I'm like 26, 27 years old. I'm calling up Rod Serling and telling him to cut it down. At, at least I had the presence of mind to say, well, what would we cut? And I, I, I made a kind of a trial uh, cutting of it. And I get him on the on the phone and he right away starts squawking. Uh, ah, they don't pay me enough to do this stuff. Uh, I said, well, we're just, just going to cut it down a little bit. Ah, I don't have time for this. And, and I said, well, sir, uh, I, did, uh, I did make a trial uh, cut. Would you like to hear it? Hey, yeah, okay, read it to me. So I read it to him. He said, that's fine. Goodbye. <laughs> uh, you raise an interesting question for me there. I mean, as a neophyte director, you must have found somebody like Rod Serling very intimidating. And I'm sure to a certain extent you were a bit in awe of him. Now, does that feeling ever go away even once you become a seasoned director yourself? For example, by the time you worked with Laurence Olivier on Dracula in 1978, you were a seasoned A-list director. But even at that point, did you find the idea of working with Sir Laurence Olivier a bit daunting? I kept calling him Sir, and he would keep saying, no, Larry, dear boy, Larry. And I'd say, yes, sir, Larry, sir. And about the third time this happened, I said, you have to understand, I, I grew up in England during the war, and the first movie my mother ever took me to see was Henry V. Long about 1945 or 46, I was only, you know, five years old. But I remember, remember walking in and seeing Henry V. It's very hard for me to call you Larry. But I got I got over it by by the end of the uh, filming. Frank Langella heard me call out to Olivier. Hey, Larry, for God's sake, close your mouth. Prior to Yale, had you already fallen in love with the theater, or was your time at Yale the type of experience that really did it for you? I guess I've got some theater genes in me. My mother studied at the Royal Academy uh, before the war. She was a, a student as an actress at the Royal Academy, and once uh, she married my stepfather, we came to Birmingham, where she right away not only took up in theater, but got a radio show and eventually a television show, and was performing in all kinds of, of plays and musicals that were, that were being done there, civic light opera and town and gown type, types of things. And I always enjoyed acting when I was in, 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 in grammar school and then at Indian Springs. I did a lot of acting. When I went to Yale, I got involved with the Yale undergraduate, the Yale Dramat, and I was doing some acting, but I, I realized that some of my my classmates were much better actors than me. Probably I, I had no business trying to pursue it as a full-time career. Uh, I'd let Sam Waterston do that or Austin Pendleton. They could be the, the actors because I had now, you know, had a taste of, of directing some one acts. And, and that's what I studied at the drama school was uh, directing. You are the classic old school story of the guy who started in the mailroom at Universal and then worked his way up. Yeah, after after coming out with two degrees from Yale, uh, the only job I could find after several months of hard looking was delivering mail. And part of me, the snobbish part of me, was going, oh, I can't do this. I've got all these fancy degrees and and the other part of me says, yeah, what are you having for dinner tonight? Would you like to buy some food? Uh, so I, when I arrived at the mailroom, I realized there were four of us that had master's degrees and six or seven with bachelor's degrees and all looking to work in different parts of the movie business. And that was part of the, the structure of that job was to put you on the lot so you were around different departments. And if you wanted to be a cameraman or an editor, you could go and hit on the heads of those departments and maybe start as an apprentice. And you were in a really rarefied group of extremely talented young directors who went on to do big things at Universal in the early 70s, one of whom was this guy named Steven Spielberg. Yes, yes. It was, it was Michael Ritchie, Jeannot Schwark, and then Steven comes along, who's barely 20 at the time, with his film Amblin. And 
all all the the younger kind of junior execs and, and junior producers. We we were a little click, and uh, one one of us, uh, Jerry Friedman, said, "Oh, I've got this great film from this young kid from from Cal State Long Beach." And let's go see it. And we all gathered together in the screening room one afternoon and uh, and watched Amblin. And I remember the first shot came up, which was a sun rising coming through a saguaro cactus in Arizona. And and somebody sitting next to me said, I hate this guy already. He's too damn good. Your first feature, the Bingo Long Traveling All-Stars and Motor Kings, had an amazing cast. And you have somebody like James Earl Jones, on the one hand, who is this classically trained stage actor. And then you have Richard Pryor, on the other extreme, who is a street guy, a stand-up comic. And then you've got somebody in the middle, like Billy D. Williams, who I think had done some off-Broadway stuff before he got his first TV and movie jobs. So you're a young director... It's your first feature, and you've got three completely different schools of actors. How did you deal with that? Well, it was it was quite fun. James Earl Jones was the easiest person to direct ever, and and Billy D. We're just trying to keep his arm working, you know, just being concerned about a guy playing a baseball pitcher who really is is not a baseball pitcher, but he his arm and elbow hurts just as badly. So, you know, it was just get out of Billy D's way because he knew how to he knew how that character worked. He had a, a lock on it from the beginning. And and Richard Pryor comes along. And mind you, at this time, he's not, quote, Richard Pryor, unquote. He's just Richard Pryor and a wonderfully funny comedian. And and I remember his manager saying he's going to be world famous one of these days, and you thought, yeah, I think you're right. But his, you know, I'm, I'm guessing his acting was just all kind of learned in stand-up and just in his nature of his his own personality. So he's not, not a trained actor like James Earl. So uh, different temperaments. And, and one thing you learn pretty quickly as a director is every single actor you work with is going to be different from every other actor you've ever worked with. And, and you have to you cannot treat as one size all fits all. You have to you have to treat them very individually. Find out what makes them tick, and try to get get along with them. Sometimes it's sometimes it's tougher than than you might you might think. Say, kid, this is your lucky day, Mr. Long. It turns out my uh, center field is going to do backup pitching. That being the case, we find ourselves ready to take on the services of a promising young rookie such, such as yourself. You sucking me or what? Now, we want you to understand straight off that the big time is a hard road to hold. We're on the road day and night. We hustle games where we can find them. Yeah, we barnstormers. Well, that's okay by me. And uh, you got to bring your own glove and your own shoe. And you can't go running to your mama when you've been up all night now. But you worry about me, I ain't no baby. And uh, the money ain't all that great. That's right, rookies get half share. Say what? Of course, you being a husker and all, uh, you ain't exactly a rookie. <laughs> So share and share alike. That's the all-star model. Ain't that right, Leon? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that sounds real good. Uh, well, I want to warn you now. This ain't no measly paper contract. One touch. And you made yourself a handshake deal with the bingo long traveling all-stars and motor kings. And there ain't nothing more solemn and binding under the law than an agreement of this kind. You've worked with a lot of very complicated artists whose talents also had a price. One of them, of course, was Richard Pryor. Do you see a correlation between someone's brain chemistry not being so perfect and also having a unique creative take on the world? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I think that uh, what we're getting from these, these great artists is a lot of creativity, which means that your brain doesn't work exactly the same way. We're looking for new ways of looking at things, not same old, same old. I mean, people who think in this inside the box are not very not very creative. But you know, a lot of the kind of people we see who are creative, we often say, "Well, they're really strange or they're really odd." But that's what you know. That's where all this good stuff is coming from. So you know, it may be frustrating to work with a difficult writer or director or an actor who's really good, but. If you get one that's totally compliant, 
and and does everything you wish and nothing original comes out, it could be pretty boring. You're just getting, you know, like the reviewers say, a workmanlike job. Seguro. Quiero el desayuno en mi habitación. Dante Puerto Gabriel checkers the Via Heros. What's all this fake talk, Charlie Snow? Hey, that's another thing, man. No more of this Charlie Snow stuff. From now on, I'm going to be known as Carlos Navarra, <laughs> the Real Atletico del Mundo. I'm going to break into the majors as a Cuban. <laughs> You've been burning in the sun too long for that, man. What you mean burning in the sun too long, man? They got Cubans down in Cuba, blacker than you, make you look like a goddamn albino. Me? Yeah, you, man, and they still ain't no Negroes. That's right. Yo soy el baseballito supremo. That's me, Carlos Navarra. We're currently in a time where identity politics is ruling the roost, and this is particularly so on the liberal side of the spectrum, which is what runs show business for the most part. In the mid-70s, when you made that film, was there any pushback about the fact that you were making, even though it was a comedy, it was a very honest film about the black experience in this country. Uh, there were some really ugly moments in it where you show racism in all of its negative light, not to mention its absurdity. Was there any pushback that this movie was being made by a bunch of white guys about black Americans? Not a whisper that I ever heard. As, as, you, as you know from just looking at the credits, it was a Motown production, Motown Motown bought the rights to the book and put a lot of their own money into the production of the movie. Universal had faith in it, but only a limited faith. And Barry Gordy poured a lot of his own money into, into paying the salaries of some of the actors. And, and our composer, our composer was a Motown composer, Billy Goldstein. And the main producer was my partner, Rob Cohen. And yeah, the two of us about as white as you get. And both the screenwriters were white. Yes, yes, uh, and as, as was the original book by Bill Brashler. But all of us trying our best to be as respectful, of course we knew we were not experts on the black experience. Uh, we were doing our best to listen to our actors and listen to anybody who wanted to you know, comment on it, especially Barry Gordy uh, and, and people on his staff. Uh, so that uh, we weren't we weren't coming off disrespecting, you know, the the world that we were talking about. And of course, your next film was arguably the most iconic movie of the late seventies, and that was Saturday Night Fever, uh, a completely different genre, of course. And a lot of people might not be aware that you came in at the eleventh hour and replaced John Avildsen, who had just done Rocky. So that must have been a very daunting task for you. Well, it certainly is one one way that doing television for, at that point, five or six years had paid off because I was so used to going into things where you you prepped it really fast, even movies of the week, and, and you had to get a handle on it. The other, the other thing was that the script was so good and, and the world that we were in at Brooklyn was... It was just wonderful to work there because it was, you could see it. I treated it like I was a documentarian coming over from England, trying to photograph what was happening in Brooklyn at that time. Because I had, of course, I'd never, never been to Brooklyn more than, you know, going to Peter Luger's once in my life. That was the extent of my Brooklyn experience. And great, great stake. When John Travolta did Saturday Night Fever, he was a big TV star on Welcome Back, Cotter, which was probably my favorite show as a kid. Did you get any hint that both he and the film were going to just shoot into the stratosphere like that? I can't think of another actor since James Dean and Rebel Without a Cause, which was 20 years prior to Saturday Night Fever, that had that sort of effect on popular culture. That's an interesting point. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I remember... I'm old enough to have been there when James Dean was doing that. And I still have a red jacket that I went out and bought after Rebel Without a Cause. It was the wrong damn kind of jacket, but it kind of looked like it. It was the best I could find in Birmingham. <laughs> but, but Travolta, after I had watched him for 
just a couple of days of shooting and and seeing the response to him in Brooklyn, it was crazy. I mean, he, we had to shut down filming two days in a row because the crowds were so humongous. And I wound up telling Michael Eisner, who was then the president of Paramount, and Barry Diller, who was the chairman, I said, I hope you guys know that you've got a major undiscovered star here. This is going to be fabulous. And they, they of course, not having seen much of any of the film, went, oh, yeah, John, of course, right. Thank you. Thank you for telling us. But, you know, when you saw the film, you you knew that this was a major, major deal. He just jumps off the screen at you in almost every scene that he's in. What a raise. You kidding me? Well, come on, look, see how much it is. You gave me a raise, thank you. I can't believe this. Wait, whoa, whoa, you better look first. I don't gotta look, it don't make no difference. You gave me a raise, that's the important it's thing. It's only 250. So what? It's two dollars fifty cents. It ain't much. The important thing is to raise. I think that's really great. I'll tell you what. I'm going to give you three fifty, right? You Next week I'll give you three fifty. I'll give you a dollar more. Like well, wait. It is. Shut up, will you? Four. I'll make it an even four. Right. Never seen anybody so shit ass happy over a crummy two fifty raise. Wait a minute. Two. You just said four dollars, didn't you? John, in addition to having this wonderfully playful personality, you know, was also grown up enough to understand where he was going and to know that he was going to be huge. It, it didn't catch him by surprise. He knew it early on. But then you guys did something very capitalist, which ultimately <laughs> was kind of a failure, which was you recut a PG version of Saturday Night Fever and released it theatrically the following year in 1978. How did you feel about the recutting of this? Were, were you for it? Was it your idea or was it the brass of Paramount? It was Paramount's idea completely, based on what you said, that uh, that so many kids were getting their parents to take them. And they said, we could do this PG version. At that point, I, at that point, I had a choice because I thought it was a terrible idea, but they were going to do it no matter what I thought. And I said, well, all right, let me help you. Let me try to, you know, reduce the amount of butchering that is likely to go on and try to make it as smooth because before we even started shooting, I had said to Robert Stigwood, you know, Robert, at some point they're going to want to put this on television and, and we're going to be screwed because we've got so much foul language. I should cover some of this for, for television, some of the more, more profane moments where the language gets out of control. That's interesting. Somebody with, without a television background would never have considered that. Well, I had I had sat through uh, a lot of sessions with the with the NBC censor or the CBS censor, you know, and knew what they would uh, go for and not go for. So I knew we needed to cover that. And Robert said, "No, don't worry about that. You know, we'll deal with that later." And I thought, "No, nah, I better cover it right now while we're right here." So we would do we would do takes until we got good ones of the way Norman had written it. And then we would do one, we would do one where we cleaned up the the language. And I remember the young actors were all resisting it, and they didn't they didn't like the idea because they believed rightly so that what we had going was very special and pure, and we were just kind of homogenizing and blanding it out. And and I had to say to these young actors, uh, do you guys know what residuals are? No, what are those? Well, every time it goes on TV, you got to check. Okay, let's do that TV version, they said. It didn't take them more than a heartbeat to, to change their tune. Well, you guys have the Moses effect. You arrive and a crowd parts like the Red Sea. <laughs> they know the faces that's so cool. How you like your father? What father? I look like your father? Please don't call me that. I never could stand that. But yeah, I think the place is, uh, you know, energizing. Hey, it's all right, huh? Great, great, great man. Hey, are you as good in bed as you are on that dance floor? <laughs> well, are you? Are you as good in bed as you are on the dance floor? Hey, you never made it in a bed. <laughs> 
Watch this. This this ain't my regular partner, but you'll see. Anyway, it it is what it is. It didn't open well at all. It didn't stay there. Uh, we did the best you could do with it. But of course, everybody knew it was fake. And, you know, but that, all I can say is that's the version that ran on television for, you know, 30, 40 years. Now, now it only, you know, will run on HBO where they'll run uh, or one of those kind of Netflix things. And, uh, and they'll, they'll run the original version. But for so long, what what we did, that work that we did in making the PG version became the TV version that many people, that's all they knew until they started letting the the uncut version come out. And then he went from Saturday Night Fever to doing the lush period epic adaptation of Dracula, which is such a beautiful film. It has an old school sort of David Lean feel to it. You also got the great Gil Taylor to be your DP on that. Oh, that was that was so terrific. Uh, I, I got to Gil because Richard Donner had worked with him on The Omen, and Richard and I were friends, and and he steered me toward Gil. We knew we couldn't be doing uh, a straight adaptation of the Broadway version that Frank Langella had starred in on Broadway for eight months because it was it was so stylized that. It was not going to it was going to look like a weird, really uh, weird, not in a good way kind of movie. But what we did have, we had one of the most romantic leading men of of that time and 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 a real heartthrob for for young women and, and mature women, too. So we leaned on that, on the romantic aspect of it. So it had, you know, kind of an early 19th century feeling to it. Oh, the devil. Um, not as bad as that. I did not hear you come in, Count. I am often told I have a light footstep. I was looking in the mirror. It reflects the whole room, and yet I cannot see... Forgive me, Doctor. I dislike mirrors. They are the playthings of man's vanity. You are a most uh, unusual creature, Count Dracula. Yes. Did you study any of the previous Dracula films, including F.W. Murnau's Nosferatu or the Universal Dracula? Maybe any of the Hammer Draculas before you tackled this one? I even I even saw the Andy Warhol. Dracula. You know, at the, at the time we made it, we we knew that there were over fifty or sixty Dracula movies that had been made since since motion pictures began, and many of them were South American. South Americans loved the idea, and I also learned that most every country in the world has some kind of Dracula legend, some kind of you know thing about vampires and. Things like like that. It was a universal kind of phenomenon. Uh, but we we definitely did get to look at the Hammer films, certainly the the original Universal films, because Universal produced this Dracula that I did, and they they had owned the rights uh, to John Hamilton and Balderstone Dean's uh, John Balderstone and Hamilton Dean to their play since nineteen you know. 30s, early 1930s, when when that play was originally done on Broadway, Universal bought it. We will be right back to the Hollywood interview in just a moment. But first, you can access more of this interview with John Badham on our Patreon page at Patreon slash The Hollywood Interview. John discusses Henry Fonda, Chaplin, Johnny Depp, and much, much more. Become a patron of The Hollywood Interview on Patreon, and you will receive lots of bonus materials, including outtakes from the interviews, special segments, and additional insights into Hollywood and the artists who make movies. That's Patreon slash The Hollywood Interview. Did you know the conversation continues after the podcast? Go to Facebook, The Hollywood Interview, and join the discussion. This is a community of movie fans who appreciate the artists who make the films we all love. And now... Back to the Hollywood interview. You did an adaptation of the play, Whose Life Is It Anyway, 
with the exception of the opening and the flashbacks, it's almost all on one set in the hospital. Even with a small cast, was that a challenging thing for you, or did your TV background come in again and basically make it an easier task? The challenge was how, how to make more of it What was so it didn't look like a TV medical movie of the week, you know, a Dr. Kildare or a Dr. Marcus Welby. First of all, we decided that we did not have to be all stuck in one hospital room, which is the way the play is written, that we had an entire hospital to work with, that we could also shoot it in a wide wide screen aspect ratio and lean it very heavily toward black and white. I, I wanted it to be in black and white, but MGM wouldn't go along with it, but they let me... Uh, do the production design in very desaturated ways. The, all the costumes are black, white, and gray, and all the sets are black, white, and gray. So the most color you'd get in a scene would be people's skin color or, uh, you know, light coming through the window, which might be bluish moonlight or, or daylight colors. Very limited color spectrum, but uh, to go along with that, that film. And, and I did not make any deliberate choices about, gee, I just did a big Dracula movie. Now I'll do a small movie. I was always, always looking for what do I like? What would be fun? And I had seen Whose Life Is It Anyway in England while I was doing Dracula and fell in love with it and kept after MGM, who bought the rights, if they would give me a shot at directing it. And, of course, you directed one of the great directors in that as an actor, John Cassavetes. That was so much fun having John Cassavetes there because he is the most charming, grumpy person I've ever met. He was always kind of raspy and ah, 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 but there was a heart of gold there. And he said, to, he said to me one time when I gave him an adjustment on a scene, he said, ah, OK, kid, I'm doing stuff for you I wouldn't even do for myself. You know, I've noticed you walking around this room, bending over me, examining my body. It's amazing how relaxed a woman can be when she's not in the presence of a man. He's beginning to realize what he's up against. When you were sculpting and things weren't coming out right, did you quit? No, I didn't. Well, neither do I. There is a rumor going around that you don't want any more treatment. Because I don't want to go on living like this. He's gotten himself a lawyer threatens to sue unless we discharge him. I am not asking anyone to kill me. I'm only asking to be discharged. Mr. Harrison is not capable of making any rational decision about his life or his death. That is the question to be decided. One thing you discuss in your book, and I want to talk more about the book, is how to work with difficult actors. Richard Dreyfuss has been very open about the fact that he wasn't necessarily difficult on this shoot, but he has no memory of it because his drug use was so taking over his life. Were you aware that he was under the influence during the shoot? He was amazing. He was really, really sick during that whole shoot. We didn't know whether it was uh, what it was that was causing him. We suspected it was drugs. Didn't seem to be alcohol. One thing we knew, which was we'd often only have him for two or three hours a day. And he'd come in and then he just would not be well enough to continue. And we'd, we'd have to find something else to shoot. So uh, I, I, you know, learned how out of it he was. As you say, he had no memory of doing the film. I learned that when we worked together later on Stakeout. And I made a compliment to him about some, some moment in Whose Life Is It Anyway? And, and he said, you know, I've seen that movie, so I, I know I'm in it. But I have no recollection of making it. There would be moments like uh, there's a famous scene with uh, with Christine Lottie as his doctor, four or five page scene. And as we're shooting the dailies, Richard or his close up, he would be awake and say his say his dialogue. And as soon as Christine started talking, Richard would start falling asleep and you'd watch his eyes closing it would be funny if it weren't so sad, and it, and it made Christine nuts. She got very, very irritated with, with Richard, who, who would kind of wake up just as his cue was coming around. He would kind of pull himself awake. I did laugh a lot in dailies when I saw that, because, I mean, I didn't know what else, what else could you do but, but laugh. And Richard was sitting right next to me, 
Yeah, because he always liked to come to dailies. It was it was tough for him, but as you say, he 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 did a great job with it. You know, p- pulled himself together, even though he was he was a bit of a mess at that time. One wonderful thing you do in the book is you interview dozens of other great directors who provide anecdotes and advice. One of them, of course, was John Frankenheimer. I was lucky enough to get to know John toward the end of his life. In the book, you tell an amazing story about your last conversation with John over lunch two or three days before he passed, and he said something to you where it was almost like he knew what was coming. It it reminded me on a much grander scale of Martin Luther King speaking about, I have been to the mountain, and I have seen a, you know, this and that, and I have a dream. And you just had this feeling that he was he was kind of feeling his mortality. And that was the same thing with, with John talking about, if if I come into this restaurant, you know, for lunch and sit down and and just chat with you about anything, that's one thing. But if I come in to tell you that I've got a, a serious disease and I may not hear, be here longer, I'm going to come in with a different attitude and bearing, you know, my bearing is going to be substantially different. And at the time, I, I, I took his point, but I didn't realize that he was, you know, uh, that that sick and, uh, you know, likely likely to pass so soon. Let's talk about the director's checklist, which I think is a terrific resource for neophyte directors and working directors. When, you, when you're often looking at new material or old material, sometimes you just don't know where to start, how to break it down. And, and so we started creating a list of, of things that you could check into. And I began to realize that you could take any one of these 12, 14 points and ask the question like, well, in this scene, whose point of view is it? Or what does the main character want here? What does the secondary character want? How do they go about getting it? So there's 12 or 14 questions like that that help you gain quick insight into a scene that you might otherwise just be trying to feel your way through by the seat of your pants and not have not have, you know, specific answers that you can work with your actors on. If you can if you can go up to your actor and say, you know what you want in in this scene, what tell me what what your character wants and you have an idea of what that what that goal really is, then you're going to be much more help to the actor. Because often you'll get an answer from an actor, like when you say, what does your character want? They'll go, well, I, I don't know. I guess, you know, their, their, their father beat them when they were little, but their mom left them, and, and, you know, they had a hard time in school. And I go, no, 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 no. What do you want in this scene? What's your goal? Oh, I want to persuade her to go have coffee with me. Great. That's the goal. All right. That's what we're doing. You know, so so to keep your focus, this director's checklist is keeping your focus on the important things about about a scene that if you if you don't pay attention to them, you're not going to be doing a good job acting the scene or you're not going to be helping helping your actors as a as a director. So my students at Chapman, every week we have some kind of a scene. We had two yesterday from Marriage Story, and they have to turn in uh, their director's checklist on on that particular scene from Marriage Story and uh, do it to get to get used to it. And they they like doing it, you know, and it certainly helps them later on because so for so many years, so many, many of us, have just kind of gone at it by the seat of our pants and not had an objective way to figure out what the scene is is really about and and where the dramatic points are. You've got another terrific section called The Five Biggest Mistakes Directors Make, and what you just said made me think about filibustering. Directors, one and all, talk too much. You know, we, we, we just have to over-explain, talk about mansplaining. I guess there's a director explaining and i i know for a fact that after about 10 seconds an actor's eyes glaze over and he starts thinking about checking his texts you know calling his partner anything anything but listening to you and so i i try to train my guys you know how to give directions in 10 seconds or less you said you place an emphasis on using verbs when working with actors 
Yeah, because we're we're wanting we're we're acting a c t i n g. You know, we want active active behavior. We don't want passive behavior. And so, if we tell an actor, well, you're you're coming in this room and you're looking around, that's kind of weak and passive. If we come in and say, well, you're searching this room, you know, you're you're investigating what's going on here. We're we're picking you know active verbs that you know, that really give them a, a strong focus and not just kind of weak and passive. Because if you, if you don't have a strong focus, then you're probably not really acting. This is your second book. You wrote another terrific book called I'll Be In My Trailer, which pretty much covers your whole career. This is specifically on directing. What would you say was your primary impetus for writing both editions of this book? Well, I realized after writing I'll Be In My Trailer, which is a lot about trying to understand actors from an actor's point of view and trying to get directors over thinking that actors are puppets or meat or machines just to be turned on like they turn on their camera, trying to investigate, you know, personalities of actors and so on, that I learned so much from the writing of that and got so much feedback from different directors and actors that I said, there's more to be said here, which is how do you go about bonding with your actors? What's, you know, what's the best way to, to get, you know, where you and the actors are really creative partners and, and you're not thinking of them as, as puppets and they're, and they're trusting you because, I had learned also that so many actors don't trust directors. They've had bad experiences with them. They've they've been either non-directed or badly directed. Uh, actor directors won't talk to them because they're afraid of the actors, or they hide behind video assist and 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 they're yelling out directions from fifty feet away. Okay, let's do that again, and this time, you know, be better. They give what we call result directions. You know, okay, let's be happy on this one. Have a lot of fun with this, kids. Oh, can you cry this time? You know, asking for results rather than using good active verbs or let's let's play this scene as if you've broken your mother's best china and she's going to come in and yell at you. That that speaks to an actor. You know, you go, oh God, I know what that means. Oh shit, not. I'm in such trouble with mom that, you know, that's a good direction. But to come in and say, OK, you better be scared now is result directing. So so we're we're trying to, you know, focus focus directors on avoiding that sort of thing, like result directing. This book is basically advice for aspiring directors. If you had one piece of advice to give to an aspiring director, what would it be? Learn to work with your actors and accept them as as partners and not adversaries that's as briefly as as i can say it to match up with with uh with john frankenheimer you know never get in an argument with with your actors you will you will maybe win the battle but lose the war you've always struck me as kind of a howard hawks type director and that you're comfortable plugging into any genre any tone and you could still just get in there and knock it out of the park whereas there are some directors those will be called the auteurs who just do one type of picture over and over again. Do you see yourself as someone who has more of an ecumenical view of storytelling? Is that why you're so good at that? I think um, my theater history probably trained me a lot for that. It was, you know, one week we'd, we'd be doing Edward Albee and the next week we'd be doing Ibsen and then Shakespeare and going from one thing to another and having to make massive adjustments, trying to adjust to these different playwrights and that's that's what I found interesting about film is that you could get involved in things like Saturday Night Fever, where what I knew about disco was maybe this much, you know, like next to nothing. And what I knew about Brooklyn was even less. But, you know, I had to come in and do such a quick, quick study and learn and learn to adjust to it. I mean, that's very exciting. Same thing with war games, for example. You know, my, my knowledge of computers was maybe limited to where you plug it in. And you also came in at the 11th hour on that, if I'm not mistaken. Didn't you replace Martin Brest? I did. They were already shooting. They, they, they'd shot for several days, and they only were able to shut down for about three days. 
before they before they got me going. Thank God. I mean, Marty Brest had prepared the picture brilliantly, but uh, apparently whatever the film was coming out was not pleasing the, the UA people. And they were looking for a different tone to the film. They were looking for something much lighter, which I saw right away when I read it. You know, I thought there was a, a lot of great humor in the in the script. I thought the script was terrific and, and, and realized that 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 he and I saw the saw the same scenes in very different ways. He would see something like Matthew Broderick bringing Ali Sheedy up to uh, his bedroom and showing her how he could change the grades on her on her biology course. That was that was shot originally in a very dark way, very conspiratorial. And I thought it was funny as hell. I thought, I thought if I were as a kid and I could change a girl's grade, I would be peeing in my pants with excitement. Uh, I would be so excited that I could do that. And that's the way that's the way I directed it. And and it was just a, it was just a different of outlook because, as I say, the the rest of the picture was brilliantly prepared. Are those your grades? Yeah. I don't think that I deserved an F. Do you? You can't do that. Already done. Do you have a middle initial? K, Catherine. These are my grades. How can anybody get a D in home ec? If that's none of your business, can you erase this, please? No, it's too late. What are you doing? I'm changing your biology grade. No, I don't want you to do that. You're going to get me in trouble. No, nobody can find out. There, you just got to see. Now you don't have to go to summer school. Change it back. Why? They can't possibly... I said change it back. Okay, okay. One of the genres you really seem to be a master of is the action comedy. So, of course, I immediately thought back to Stakeout and how you were able to keep a perfect balance in that movie between some really gritty, hard-edged violence and then some truly inspired humor. What do you think the key to that balance is? Well, uh, probably starting with a belief that that life is full of, you know, horrendous things mixed up against things that are very funny. Certainly in in war games, you know, there's the danger of the of the world exploding accidentally, and then you wait and you think about it, and you go, wait a minute, a little fifteen year old kid did this. That's very funny. That you know, it's kind of. And and life is a lot like that, that you can mix these things up. So this script probably was more straightforward when when Jim Kalf wrote it. You know, I'm talking about Stakeout. And and as we got into it with Richard and then Emilio, it started to take a turn toward the, the, the funny part of it. I, th- I think the hard way was much more written as uh, incompatible buddy movie. You know, they're not buddy friends. They're, they're actually adversaries in a way, or one guy wants, one guy wants to join the team and the other guy doesn't want him on the team. So you, you get this back and forth. Now that, uh, that is funny, but against the hard edge of the, of the character of the party crasher. And, you know, just a lot of confidence that you can mix the two of these things and, and get a much more interesting drama than a straightforward thriller. In the case of Stakeout, where you had Emilio Estevez and Richard Dreyfus, what was it like working with them? Were they able to establish that great chemistry they had together instantly, or did you have to work with them to sort of develop that rapport over time? The trick was that uh, Emilio's character <clears throat> was originally originally written to be older than the Dreyfus character. And once once we had cast Richard, we said, well, who's going to be older than him that is going to work in, in this? Because by that point, he's late 40s and, you know, cops don't go on into their 60s and stuff like that. So we... We decided to flip the flip it around and make him younger. And and uh, Emilio was Emilio was cast. Well, Jim Kalf, the writer uh, and the creator of it, he said, "No, the dialogue will work there." And as we got into the first scene on the first day, which is one of the first scenes in the movie with them, uh, Emilio comes over. He said, "This doesn't work." 
this makes no sense for me. It's too stuffy. I said, well, thank God. Thank God you're a writer. And why don't you adjust the dialogue as you, as you see fit? And, you know, we'll see Jim about it and see if, if he stays okay with, you know, with the, the adjusting that we're, that we're doing. Okay, great. So he loosened up and that just started the, the chemistry because because Richard is so it's so easy for him to be funny, you know he can be very straightforward as we've seen too, and you know very very dramatic. But you know once once you put him at at a breakfast table with a fried egg sandwich that's leaking yolk all over the place, it's hard to <laughs> it's hard to keep a straight face. Oh, your hands too close to his mouth. Anything else? Yeah, I'd like another cup of coffee, please. Okay. And I'd like a side order of sausage. Yeah. How long has he been in there? About 10 minutes. That is disgusting. Really? My God, do you eat like that in front of your mother? It's an old family custom. Well, I'll tell you, it's not healthy. Mm. You've got to take your time. Do you have any idea what that does to your digestive system? No, but I'm afraid you're going to tell me. You've got to savor the qualities of the cuisine. First, the smell. Oh, for Christ's sake. Mm. All right, come on, let's go. Right there, so, the, you know, dividing their, their personal life and their, and, their, and their professional life in two parts you know, happens in that scene. They're in their personal life. They're they're having these silly arguments about how how nicely to eat your food and not upset your stomach. And then they look out the window and they see this guy that they've been looking for. And suddenly they have to switch gears into being, you know, very professional. So Emilio's line referencing Jaws, this was not a boating accident. That was improvised by him? That was improvised by them. Because what what we developed a, a routine, which was I would rehearse the scene as written, and we would line it up, and then Emilio and and Richard would go back to their trailer and kind of mess around with it, and come back and and do a version of the scene. It was somewhat similar. It was a second cousin to the scene. They stayed in the same staging, but suddenly there was all kinds of new dialogue. And in there, including this was not a boating accident, which is just a, a brilliant self-referential kind of kind of thing, you know, in 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 joke that everybody everybody appreciated. For On me. the waterfront. Who said it? Um, Lee J. Cobb. Uh, All right, sixteenth uh, president of the United States. Uh, I don't know. I'll give you a hint. Abe Lincoln. You're right, you're right. Okay, okay, what movie, what movie? Um, uh, well, this was not a boating accident. I don't know. Oh, you're hopeless. 15. A movie you did not long after Stakeout is my second favorite John Badham movie next to Saturday Night Fever, and that's Nick of Time. It's one of the great thrillers of that decade and a very worthy Hitchcock homage. My question is, did you watch a lot of Hitchcock pictures before you made this one? Probably, uh, yes, but over the decades... You know, starting to watch, you know, back going going back to Vertigo. Well, tell us a bit about Johnny Depp. I've always found him to be a, a fascinating actor, but he's certainly become a controversial figure over the past several years. What was your take on Johnny? Boy, I I thought here here's a guy who's coming into this because he's played a lot of odd characters up to up to that point, and this to him is an odd character, a straightforward guy. <laughs> is something that's a bit odd and 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 he's he's always just slightly there's something slightly off about Johnny Depp that that makes him interesting you know not just a good looking leading man which which he is like that 130 California Ballroom that's right that gives you 28 minutes to get your shit together let me talk to her again. No. I want to talk to her. Forget it. You let me talk to her, you can forget it. 
Don't you threaten me, young man. Be a lot less trouble if you just let me talk to him. You're wasting time. Mm. Come back. Yeah. Put her on. What gives? Just put her on. Daddy? Yeah, honey, it's me. I'm tired. I want to go now. I know you do, honey. So do I. Can we go now? Not just yet, baby. Daddy has to do something first. Of course, the other film uh, that used that device was High Noon. Was High Noon an influence on Nick of Time? Well, definitely. I mean, I I had definitely read about the the difficulties the film went through in early previews, where uh, for some reason it was just falling flat. And between the editors and Frank and Fred Zinnemann, they started to you know put a clock on it and put uh, put shots of that clock in, which raised the suspense factor tremendously. And uh, with with this particular script, that was kind of built into it from from the beginning, you know, to say, well, we've got an hour and a half before, you know, this little girl is in trouble. And let's 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 remind people of that. So we, we did depend on that tremendously. And and I and I certainly have high noon to thank for that. The great Christopher Walken. Tell us about him. Wow. Interesting. I think once once we started shooting, uh, Chris almost never left the set. If if he was going to be in in a scene that day, he would be sitting over in the corner, and especially if he had to work with any kind of props, uh, he he was just sitting there making sure that he got it right. There's one scene, for example, where he gets in. He gets in the elevator with Johnny Depp and he's trying to force uh, a pistol on him and has to load the pistol with uh, w- with a fresh load of ammunition. And and it all has to look very slick and very good. Well, he was sitting there rehearsing that, you know, time after time after time. Nothing casual about him. You know, he was taking everything so seriously and and really the, the hardest working, you know, professional that I'd encountered for a long time. You know, there's an opening, opening sequence where he first accosts Johnny Depp and the and the daughter, the little girl. They go out to the van, and he tells him what he has to do. And in the process, they wind up shooting a, a photograph of Johnny Depp. They create an ID card for him. He's, you know, thrusting all kinds of him and very prop heavy. And he, I guess, you know, I, I'm always told that, that uh, Chris was a was a dancer, a very skilled dancer. And in Pennies from Heaven, you can see the examples of it. But like a dancer, he rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed to get things perfect in his in his mind. And, uh, you know, I just have to get out of his way. That's the best thing you can do with Chris is, uh, and and with Johnny Depp, just get out of their way, let them do their thing, and if they if they need help, you can step in, but don't screw it up. Is always my 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 feeling. Mr. Watson, pay attention, and your daughter won't be hurt. All right, honey, come to daddy. Ah! Oh. Mr. Watson, you're not paying attention. Your daughter's life depends on you. Do you understand? Do you understand that? Yes. Good. This is for you. In it, there's a picture of a woman and an itinerary. It's her itinerary. She is presently. You listening, Mr. Watson? Yes. She is presently at the Bonaventure Hotel. It's not far from here. When you leave this van, you get yourself a taxi over there and you will take it to the Bonaventure Hotel. Then, you will take this, and you will kill a woman whose picture's in there. Not just shoot her, mind you, kill her. I recommend you empty the gun into her, close up. You got all that? You're out of your mind. What's your point? So, which brings us to the hard way. It could have gone two ways. It could have been a completely serious 
deadly dark drama about a crazy actor and an equally crazy cop and the effect they have on each other, or a completely zany comedy, and you managed to tread the line between the two. Was the script always that tone, or did it go through different rewrites and iterations? It always had a sense of humor about it. It was a little bit darker. I think that once we cast Michael in it and Jimmy Woods, we we pushed it in the direction of uh, of being a little bit funnier, mostly just in the dialogue. Dan Pine's original script is very close to this, just some changes in, in, in dialogue, uh, making it a little more amusing. Our original casting for it was going to be Kevin Klein and Gene Hackman. Oh, interesting. So that's kind of a different tone, right? You know, we, we love Kevin Klein and thought here for playing, you know, a vain Hollywood actor that he, he could bring that off, you know, beautifully. And, and he's got that enough of a sense of humor without playing it for comedy. And, and Hackman would be a good, you know, French connection type adversary for him. Kevin signed on and then got an offer of a Broadway play, I forget which, and had to make a choice between the two. So my partner, Rob Cohen, said, well, let's get Michael J. Fox. And he agreed right away. <laughs> and Gene Hackman said, and that's like acting with my grandson. I, <laughs> I, that's, that's not right. Uh, and you go, yeah, maybe, maybe the, the gap is a little bit big. But so Jimmy Woods came to mind as, you know, an abrasive, tough cop, energetic, uh, aggressive and uh, in complete contrast to this this newbie guy who's thrilled that he's able to pretend to be a cop. And, and it's just the whole casting is, is a funny idea. Movie star Nick Lang is looking for a part that could change his image. You don't want me to grow up. The studio doesn't want me to grow up. I'm the only one who wants me to grow up. So to play a real cop, Please. he's oh. going to study with the best. If I can walk his beat, if I can get under his skin, I will nail this part in. Detective John Marks is on the trail of a killer. This party crasher has whacked out seven people. He's going to do it again soon, today, maybe. And what if this cop doesn't want you tagging after him? Two pros exchanging ideas. Why wouldn't he want to do it? Not if you tied my tongue to your tailpipe and drove me 80 miles an hour naked across a field of broken glass. Well, James Woods is, I mean, there's another actor who I always thought he was just one of our national treasures, but he also had a rather checkered reputation for a long time. Did you find him challenging to work with or was it a good experience? The thing I, I learned about Jimmy is you, you, have to, you have to call him on his bullshit and just say, I know you're smart and I know you think you're getting away with something, but come on, Jimmy, you know, don't do That's just silly. You know, I don't believe, believe that because if, if Jimmy comes up to you in the morning and says, hi, Alex, how are you doing? He's got some other agenda going. He's always got another agenda going. You know, he wants something from you. And I just would laugh at it and, and it would bring him off that kind of aggressive thing that he was was known for and i and i think I, I i learned a lot of that from oliver stone who'd worked with him on salvador you know just don't don't take his crap will you open up i just want to know what it feels like to be inside your skin i don't want you inside my skin do you understand it's private what's in there belongs to me you're not going to learn what it means to be a cop by eating hot dogs and picking your teeth and asking stupid questions we live this job it's something we are not something we do Every time a cop walks up to a car and has to give a speeding ticket, he knows he may have to kill someone or be killed himself. That's not something you step into by strapping on a rubber gun and riding around all day. You get to go back to your million dollar beach house and your bimbos and your blowjobs and you get 17 takes to get it right. We get one take. It lasts our whole lives. We mess it up and we're dead. Fuck, was that great. Michael J. Fox, I've never heard a bad word about. I always heard that he's a consummate pro and is as likable in real life uh, as he comes across on the screen. In fact, I read in doing some research on the hard way that James Woods had a hard time being mad at him because he liked him so much personally. How could you not like Michael? I mean, his attitude was completely professional, 
you know, will try anything, has always got a great, a great sense of humor. And, I, and I'm thinking, I've thought since then that, that he may have had the beginnings of his illness then, because it wasn't long after that that he started to announce it. So if that's true, he was wrestling with those kind of, you know, symptoms and feelings while he was doing the movie. I never would have known it, but I couldn't help, you know, thinking, thinking about it. And he was always there with great energy and great enthusiasm and really giving it, giving it his all so that Jimmy's efforts to upstage him were wonderful, fun battles to watch because you you had to be playing your A game to be in scenes with either one of those guys and put the two of them together. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's it's all you could do to see who was upstaging the other. What was Mel Gibson like to work with on Bird on a Wire? How was your experience with Mel? Wow. What fun. What fun to work with a guy so professional and, and knew how to do action scenes. I mean, there's a whole technique for for actors doing action scenes that nobody teaches you, that you can only learn by by doing it. And clearly in doing the uh, Road Warrior films, he had learned from George Miller all kinds of techniques and, you know, taught me a lot about you know, acting, acting techniques, hard to describe. This seems, you know, uh, small, but, but he was teaching Goldie Hawn too at the, at the time to get the best out of, out of action, action moments as an actor. And one of the, one of the fun things about watching Mel was in rehearsals for, for scenes in rehearsals the weekend before we'd get together and rehearse the scenes for the next week. He would be so low key. Goldie would be playing the scenes full out. Like, we're going to shoot it right now. No, Goldie, we're just rehearsing. We're just sitting in your living room here in Vancouver <laughs> rehearsing. But she's, she's just got to play it. Well, Mel is going through it like he could care less. And he's just here to be polite, but not interested in the scene. And the next day, you're lining the scene up on the stage with camera and crew and everybody. Same thing. And then you you finally say action, and this whole other Mel Gibson comes alive. This sucker has been hiding it from you the whole time, and it's it's an acting technique that uh, that many people use, which is they don't commit to the character until they're really comfortable in it, and they'll underplay, underplay, underplay until it gets to the point where they can really, you know, fit the part. Rick, what? Are you all right? Oh, God. I've been shot in the butt. Can you believe it? Can I come in? Well, I'm naked. Can you handle it? Well, I handled it for a lot of years. I guess I can handle it now. Oh. Oh, oh God. It's my lower back and my butt. I think the pellet passed straight through, but... Vietnam, huh? Uh-huh. Uh, hell no. I, I took the dove off with a sander. You know... I really am anxious to hear this story. Marion, I need some bandages and some antibiotic and some antiseptic. Get shot off in New York? No, only only twice before. Marion, could you please help me? Could you look at my butt here? You leave me at the altar, right? I mean, that was my state of mind at the time, okay? You went off with Jamie to seek your fortune, and you were coming back to marry me. Now, am I remembering this correctly? Because if I'm not, I want you to correct me. You get lost in your plane, you're reported missing, you're presumed dead. I attend your memorial service and I cry the tears of a grieving widow. Muffy, I just vow listen. I'll never get over you. In fact, I never do. I still carry your damn pictures in my wallet. Until one day, I pull into a gas station and you're alive with people chasing you. And you ask me to look at your butt? I mean, that's okay. That's kind of neat. You know, Rick's alive and he's shot in the butt. Hey, guys, guess who's alive and shot in the butt? Yeah, Rick, I'm looking at his butt right now. You lying. And then Mel will come out with, 
with ad libs in scenes that if you just if you were a student of his and studying, you know, him, you'd say, well, that's a that's a Mel ad lib right there. Oh, my God. What's the movie he did with with Jodie Foster and James Garner uh, Maverick? There's a big stagecoach action scene in there. Well, it's just filled with Mel is ad libbing up one side and down the other. And they just like have neon signs on them saying Mel wrote this. Mel said this. Uh, but it's, it, it keeps the scene alive. And what it means is that the other actors, you know, have to stay on their toes. You're not just going to get a mechanical readback of, of their, the dialogue they expect. And, and so you put them with people that are sharp, like Jody and, and Jim Garner. You know, and suddenly you've got electricity happening. When you look at your work from 30, 40, even 50 years ago now, do you like looking at your old movies and TV shows? Well, I think I used to look at them a lot more than I did. But uh, but uh, over several years now, I just have not because I'm always trying to look forward. And I, and I don't want to be one of those one of those old guys sitting in a room watching your old films. You know, it feels like something out of Sunset Boulevard to me. So when I when I do go back and look at something, it's almost accidental. Or somebody says, well, we're going to have a screening of War Games. Or last year at the DGA, they did Saturday Night Fever. And I get to go in and see it freshly with an audience. Well, that's fun. You know, hope, hopefully there's not too many cringe moments in there. But, you know, things that I thought were not good, but I had rationalized in my mind that, well, it'll be okay. Nobody will notice. You go back 30 years later and you go, yes, we do. It's still there. <laughs> this this little compromise we made is still sticking out like a sore thumb. Before the COVID lockdown hit and production stopped, did you, did you get anything new in the can that we can look forward to seeing soon? The last show I did was a series called Siren that I had done several episodes of. And it was great, great fun, kind of science fiction fantasy about mermaids on land, which sounds a little bit ridiculous, but it was wonderfully, wonderfully dark piece and wonderful characters. So I had, you know, great, great fun. And one of my favorite things to do is to working with little children and with babies. And we had, we had one scene with a dozen newborns in it, who are all individual characters. I, <laughs> that's that's really, uh, I don't know if herding cats is easier. If you want to learn more about John Badham, please check out his website at johnbadham.com. Also pick up his books, I'll Be In My Trailer and John Badham on Directing. Notes from the set of Saturday Night Fever, War Games, and more. You can find them both on amazon.com. My thanks to Allison Van Etten for coordinating this interview. Did you know the conversation continues after the podcast? Go to Facebook, The Hollywood Interview, and join the discussion. This is a community of movie fans who appreciate the artists who make the films we all love. The Hollywood Interview is produced by me, Alex Simon, for Wanderer Productions, executive produced by Connell O'Herlihy for No One Else Media.